earth science, minerals. Uh, elements and atoms are the basic bil building blocks of minerals, and minerals are what makes up rocks. Here's an example of granite, a type of rock, type of rock we find in the continental crust. It's made up of four key minerals, feldspar, uh, quartz, mica, amphibole. Quartz is a clear white mineral in, my, in granite. Feldspar is a pink mineral. Amphibole and mica are, are both a black, dark kind of mineral. Uh, minerals are made up of elements. There's eight common elements that compose 98% of continental crust rocks. The oxygen and silicon comprise most of those elements. Uh, followed by aluminum, iron, calcium, sodium, potassium, magnesium, and then just uh, about 1.5% other minerals. Here we have a periodic table of the elements, and silicon is number um, element number 14, aluminum is element number 13, oxygen element 8, iron, and that's a Latin lettering, ferrous um, number 26, calcium number 20, magnesium number 12, sodium, which is again a Latin, le Latin lettering, um, number 11, and potassium number 19. Carbon is number six. Here's an example of four different minerals, quartz, feldspar, mica, and amphibole, and the elements that make up each one of those minerals. It's notable that quartz really just contains oxygen and silicon. Uh, the rest of them all contain some aluminum, and depending on uh, the amounts of the other elements and their combinations, um, will depend on whether you get a feldspar, mica, or an amphibole. So here's a, again our quartz, and we have oxygen and silicon. And here's some examples of quartz. We have a crystalline quartz like you'd find in hot springs, and then a, a white quartz and a rose quartz, and then here's a crystalline smoky quartz. Notice, notice both ends of that smoky quartz are, are pointed. It's because you can, get, you can get quartz crystals that are pointed at both ends. And by the way, quartz, quartz will fracture if you break it. It doesn't break on nice clean lines because the silicon and oxygen uh, bonds are covalent bonds and the really strong bonds. Here's our uh, table of the elements again looking at feldspar. Feldspar includes oxygen, silicon, aluminum, calcium, um, sodium, and potassium. Mica contains oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, potassium, and, the, and then an amphibole contains oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, calcium, and magnesium. An atom is the smallest particle that retains the characteristic of an element. And an atom is made up of protons and neutrons, which are in the nucleus of an atom, and then an electron cloud that surrounds it. And here's two examples of two different types of, of atoms. We have a helium atom and a neon atom. Both are in balance. They have two protons and two, two neutrons for helium, or two um, electrons for a helium. So it's, it balances out two, two protons or plus two, not two electrons or minus. And the same with neon. You have 10 positive protons and 10 positive neutrons. <clears throat> an ion is an atom with a different number of protons and electrons. So in this case, an oxygen, oxygen has two vacant sites because uh, the the um, second uh, second part of the cloud of electrons around the nucleus has a space for for two extra electrons. Silicon has a space for four extra light electrons. It's just like parking spaces, and um, outside the silicon atom. So here's a question: Assuming that the number of protons is the same as the number of electrons, which picture represents the atom of carbon? Well, carbon is the atomic number of six, and so that means you'd have six electrons, so A would be the answer. And in this one, um, we're looking at the mineral olivine, and olivine, you know, what, what's the chemical formula for olivine? Well, the secret to this is to look at the plus and minus of each of the elements and that's a the, the diagram is really a little small but oxygen is a minus two silicon is a plus four and magnesium is a plus two 
So basically for this um, answer you're just adding up pluses and minuses till they balance. Well, so you get how many oxygens Let's, let's pick the answer and use the one for the answer. Four oxygens minus two, that'd be minus eight. This four, minus, four times minus two is minus eight. Well, silicon is plus four, and so that leaves another plus four to balance the minus eight, and so then you'd have two magnesiums. Well, you have ionic and covalent bonds. The strongest bonds are covalent bonds. Ionic bonds, um, are a balance of negative and positive charges of different ions. And an example is rock salt. And a covalent bond is strong because it's a sharing of electrons between elements. And a diamond is a good example of a really strong covalent bond. It's a very strong atomic structure. And I, here's an example of what we find with rock salt. And that's why that's why when you when you um, it, you can break rock salt pretty easy because it the ionic bonds between the parts of the salt break. So if you if you take it and push rock salt between your fingernails, you can break it, but you can't do that with a diamond because it's a lot stronger bond. Um, here's a crystalline structure of rock salt for these ionic bonds, this balance of negative and positive charges. So you have a, a large chlorine atom that's minus and a smaller um, a sodium atom is plus and they balance so here we have a, a balance of the atoms and the, uh, the the atoms will form together in a cube and then that cube it gets larger and larger and larger the mineral will be cubic as well covalent bonds example of a covalent bond is water where you're sharing electrons between the oxygen and the hydrogen so you have this cloud of electrons and the uh, electrons are shared um, between the different the three different elements um, silicon or silica combines silicon and oxygen and they they join together by a combination of ionic and covalent bonding and so silica is um, forms a shapes that are tetrahedral in shape and you can see a little pyramid of a four-sided tetrahedron in the middle of the, the diagram B. So you have four, four oxygens that surround the smaller silicon atom in, inside that tetrahedron. An example of um, an example of silicates are the, uh, the uh, minerals that we saw in the granite earlier, quartz, feldspar, mica, and am amphibole are all silicates because they all contain those silica tetrahedrons in their in their um, mineral structures. So the different type of bonds results in minerals of different strengths. Um, you can think of ionic bonds if you take Velcro and, and uh, um, pull Velcro apart. That's like an ionic bond. Whereas a covalent bond is like a rope. A rope is really hard to break. You can pull on a rope and you can break it, but it's really hard to do. Um, then that last point, minerals formed with covalent bonds are stronger and more resistant to destructive forces at the Earth's surface. Well, that's why you find quartz sand, because quartz as a covalent bond in the silica is really hard to break. It's really a strong bond. Here's some examples of silica tetrahedra that combine together. Um, you have an isolated silicate. We just talked about olivine, the magnesium silicate, uh, Mg2SiO4. And then you have a single chain silicate, which is a mineral, minerals, um, pyroxene kind of minerals. And you, you won't remember all these types of mineral names. Um, and then you get double chains of tetrahedrons that are amphiboles. And then you get a sheet silicate where you have these silica tetrahedrons that join together in sheets. And mica is a, a real strong sheet one direction and then you can pull it apart the other direction. And then a framework silicate, it would be like a quartz or feldspar and that's why, that's why they're so strong because they, they build like strong building blocks. 
Here's an example of our silicate. And this is one of those things where you want to click it, right click these things and click play if it doesn't run. And I just did. So if it doesn't run, right click it and click play. Click clay. So here's an example of we're seeing different structures with these um, silica tetrahedrons bonding together. And I'll play it again here before we move on. And here's a framework silica structure. I'm going to play it again. So here's this one tetrahedron and the tetrahedron combines into the chain. So it's a pyroxene. Then those combine together into an amphibole. Amphibole. And those combine together into sheet silicates like a mica. And those combine together into a framework like a quartz or feldspar. Okay, here's a question. Which, which formula represents a silicate? Well, a silicate combines silica in the mineral structure. And silica is, remember silica tetrahedron has silicon element and oxygen element together. Well, which of these has silicon and oxygen? B does. And it's the mineral orthoclase that we find in granite. It was that pink mineral that we saw at the very first slide. Here's some minerals, aragonite, calcite, graphite, diamond. Um, so is an icicle hanging from a ledge of mineral? Yes, it is. Icicles are a mineral crystal called crystalline. Copper is a native element. One of the reasons that the, one of the, the first weapons were made out of copper back before the bronze was invented was because people could just find copper laying on the ground and melt it out of the rocks and it would just, just melt and they could they could use it to, to make weapons out of it. Not very strong weapons, but better than a stick or um, um, an, oxid, an oxide or a hydroxide is um, either an oxygen or an oxygen um, um, hydrogen. Halide is just a uh, chlorine um, with, in this case, a, a halide would be sodium chlorine. A carbonate would be a, um, carbon and oxygen combined, and then those would link up with uh, calcium to form calcite. And limestone is a rock that has lots of calcite in it, as an example. A sulfate and a sulfite. Sulfate, and the A means that there's oxygen combined, and the I means there's not. So um, um, calcium sulfate, a uh, name for that would be an anhydrite, and a pyrite would be what we talked about earlier, fool's gold or iron pyrite. A silicate, um, a silicate would be like olivine, and there's other silicates that we looked at earlier. So it's important to look at the A there to, to know that there's oxygen whereas the I, there's not. Minerals are naturally occurring in organic solids of one or more elements that have a definite chemical composition with an orderly internal arrangement of atoms. That's a mouthful. You can think of it just as remembering that they're natural, that they're not organic. In other words, they're not like oil or, or coal. They don't have carbon in them. They're solids. They're not like liquid or gas. Um, they have one or more elements so they could have one, they could have a bunch of elements. And there's a definite, definite chemical composition. In other words, the atoms are arranged a certain way. So you have quartz and feldspar, which are arranged in a framework. Those tetrahedron silicons are a framework with some extra, extra elements involved in the case of feldspar. In the case of mica, they're arranged in sheets, and the mica breaks as sheets. And so the little tetrahedrons are, are made in a sheet. Galena is a, um, a lead zinc ore that's a cube. And there's lots of galena mines that used to be um, active in northeast Oklahoma, southeast Kansas. And um, back when we put lead in paint and gasoline and um, used zinc batteries, that was they, they made lots of money up there. Iron pyrite is an iron sulfite. 
basically it's iron and sulfur again in a in a cubic shape and some people call iron pyrite fool's gold because it, it looks gold in color but it's just iron and sulfur and halite is um, sodium chloride again a cube and the, the three at the bottom are all kind of cubic in shape oh that's a sulfide it's iron sulfide is what the um, iron pyrite is okay um, <clears throat> So let's look at mineral characteristics. Minerals have a crystal form, and here's some examples of crystal form. Common shapes, you can read there, prisms, pyramids, needles, cubes, sheets. That's why we like, um, 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 that's why we go to um, jewelers <laughs> and buy rocks for rings and things like that because they're in a crystal form. So, in this example of um, rock salt on the left and quartz on the right, you have well-formed crystal structures. And so you have a crystal ha habit of 90 degrees with halite or rock salt, and a crystal habit of a um, hexagonal with 120 degrees between the sides with, um, with quartz. So even though that would break if you would if you would if you would break that beautiful mineral don't do it but if you break it it would break in conchoidal fractures when the crystal is built it builds with a nice hexagonal crystal so strong um, water also comes in a crystal form there you see a snowflake you see a picture of rock salt and you can even get a microscope out and look at very uh, on down to where the smaller and smaller you get, it will continue to have the same crystal form no matter how small you get. And that's true um, with uh, because the, again, like I said earlier, the elements combined together form that structure and then they get bigger and bigger. Well, you start breaking them up and smaller and smaller, it keeps the same elemental structure. And um, so here we see, that's why you can take you put salt on a table and it stands up because it's cubic. It's it's like a big box. So we looked at crystal structure as one of the important parts of a mineral. So crystal structure, so jot that down as number one. Number two is color. Color is a characteristic of mineral that you can use to identify a mineral. And color often varies with impurities. So um, um, an example of that is pyrite is always gold, but quartz um, with just silicon and oxygen can have just minor amounts of other other elements in it which will give it a milky color or a smoky color or a rose or black different 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 colors of quartz same with um, same with any of the uh, kind of rocks that we put into rings min minerals we put into rings um, they might have a little impurities in them and make them uh, more valuable from that standpoint so color um, Dark, you can have dark minerals and light minerals. An example of dark minerals would be olivine, amphibole, pyroxene, biotite, mica. And light minerals would be quartz, feldspar, muscovite, mica, or calcite. And so here's some examples. These are quartz, different types of quartz we looked at earlier. Um, okay, so we had um, um, crystal structure, then we had color. Now we can also have streak. You can take a mineral and take it, put it on a, and rub it across a piece of porcelain like bathroom tile and it will streak. So that mineral in the lower left is a mineral called hematite and it can be red or, or gray in color, but then you streak it, it's kind of a rusty brown color. And that's one way, that's the secret to how you tell, um, well, how you can easily tell iron pyrite when you streak it it will streak a black in color so it's not gold whereas gold will streak gold luster is another mineral property luster is an example of um, how something looks when the light shines on it it might look like a metal and there's a good example of metallic luster metallic lusters um, it can also be a non-metallic luster, like vitreous, resinous, pearly, silky, dull, earthy. 
that hematite was a real earthy looking. Hardness is another um, characteristic. How hard is the mineral? How, how, how hard is it resistant to scratching? A diamond is very, very hard, whereas um, mica is pretty soft. For example, there's a hardness scale called Mohs hardness scale, and there's numbers one through ten. If we were looking at this in a lab, we would probably do a mineral identification exercise to be able to tell one mineral from another. Um, if you can scratch a mineral with your fingernail, it might that's harder than one or two. So your fingernail is like 2.5. Uh, copper um, is about the same um, hardness as calcite. A nail, like a, a na common nail you find in your garage, is about five and a half, so it can, it can scratch anything underneath it. Um, and a piece of glass, you can take a piece of glass and then take orthoclase or feldspar and scratch the glass with it. So then you know that it's it's a, a pink orthoclase and not like a pink calcite or something like that because it's harder. It's a hardness of six instead of hardness of three. However, you can take a steel file and then scratch the orthoclase, but a steel file won't scratch quartz. So you get the idea. You can use these tools and then tell um, how hard something is and know whether it's um, one mineral or another. Corundum is a low-end, um, cheaper um, mineral used to saw things in industry and a diamond blade, diamond saw blade, would be a more expensive type of saw. Diamond is the hardest mineral that exists. Here's Mohs hardness scale um, with the, compared to true hardness. So Mohs hardness scale is 1 through 10. And then true hardness would be actually how hard is something. And you can see that diamond is way more than the others. Well, let's continue talking about how you tell one mineral from another. In other words, mineral characteristics. Diaphaneity is the ability of a, a thin slice of a mineral to transmit light. Now you can see you can, you can take minerals or take rocks and make them really um, thin and shine light through them and then it helps you understand what mineral that is. It's, it's really kind of a lot of fun and they're really pretty. Um, so <clears throat> one, one word that would be a characteristic would be how transparent is, is a mineral. How translucent is it? Transparency is does light just pass through it unscattered? Is it clear or does it pass through uh, cloudy? Um, I always I'd like to go to open houses with, with my wife and we're always <laughs> amazed that people build houses with bathrooms with transparent glass in the bathroom. You can see right through it. Instead of a translucent glass that would uh, be cloudy that you couldn't see through. Um, opaque would be light doesn't get through. So that would be like the wall of the house. So there's an example. That's transparent. That'd be translucent. So there's translucent like the, this guy in the shower. And opaque, you couldn't see through it at all. Okay, another characteristic of mineral is tenacity. How resistant is it to being broken or bent? If it's brittle, that's, that means it, it just breaks. As soon as you try and bend it, it breaks. Um, and if it's elastic, that means it can bend without breaking. It returns to its original shape. So a rubber band obviously is really elastic. And that's true with minerals. Some, some minerals are brittle and some are elastic. It can also be ductile or flexible. In other words, it bends without breaking and does not return to its original shape. Lead isn't a good example of a mineral that's, that um, doesn't, doesn't um, bend back. I, rem I remember when I was a kid, we played the game Clue and the lead pipe was made out of lead in the game Clue and we always used to like to bend it in shapes because it would, it would just bend and not break. Um, uh, the, uh, mica has what we call really good cleavage and there's one good set of cleavage planes in mica. You can put it, break it in little strips. In fact, at one time mica was used to, um, to uh, use for windows 
And I remember as a kid, um, we fixed generators on cars. We didn't have alternators to generate electricity. We used generators back then. And we'd take it apart and, and put a new armature on it and file it down. And it, it had mica in between the um, different different parts of the armature of the generator. And because, because mica has one really good cleavage plane, it's a very good um, insulator. Electricity doesn't go through it very well at all. And so you can have a really thin sheet of mica and electricity won't go through it. Um, another, another example of cleavage is a feldspar. We have um, two sets of cleavage at right angles. Whereas um, um, you have amphibole, which has two cleavage planes that are not at, not at right angles, not at 90 degrees. So mica, one really good cleavage plane. Feldspar and amphibole have two good cleavage planes. Feldspar at right angles, amphibole not. So identify the following images from the mineral halide and identify how many cleavage planes are present. Well, you can look at these different pictures and see that they break in uh, three different directions. And so you have three good cleavage planes in halite. So if you take a piece of halite and break it with a hammer, it would break in three good cleavage planes. When a mineral breaks, it doesn't always just cleave. It, it, it depends on the mineral. Some minerals, like quartz, will break in what's called a conchoidal fracture and it will be more of a circular kind of a fracture. Some fractures, when you hit it with a hammer or break it, will be irregular and rough, and some are earthy or dull or smooth. Um, the black um, quartz in the upper left, or actually that's volcanic glass, when it breaks, well, you see the circles on it, it breaks in conchoidal fractures, and then um, you get the uneven and rough and then kind of earthy looking um, in the lower picture there where it's white that it looks very earthy. Those are fractures. Specific gravity. We talked about specific gravity or density when we talked about um, plate tectonics. It's the weight of a mineral relative to an equal volume of water. If one mineral feels heavier than another of the same size, the first has a higher specific gravity. And so you know, the joke is if I pick up a pound of feathers and a pound of rocks, which one's heavier? Well, they're both weigh a pound, they're the same weight. Well, <laughs> but which one is, has a higher specific gravity? That's a different question. Well, rocks would because you, you take the same volume of feathers and rocks and rocks will, will weigh more. They, they feel heavier. Um, there's special properties you can get with minerals. Um, magnetism, double refraction, chemical reaction. Um, taste, odor, and feel. With magnetism, the mineral magnetite um, will point toward north. Calcite, you can get a clear transparent calcite and look through it and you'll have a dumb it, double image. So it would look like that. Uh, calcite mineral also fizzes under acid. If I take a weak hydrochloric acid, and this is how you tell something's limestone or sandstone, for an example, because it has calcite in it. Well, of course, that's not quite true either, because sandstone can have a uh, cement between the sand grains. It's calcite, but um, the, the mineral calcite will fizz under acid. You can also taste a mineral. The mineral halite, rock salt, tastes like salt. And you can get a musty a smell on a mineral like kaolinite. Kaolinite is like chalk, so if you take natural chalk and smell it, it'll feel, smell kind of musty. And talc, talc, the mineral talc will feel kind of soapy, which is where we get talcum powder. You can take talc and break it up, and it gives talcum powder. So if, here's magnetite, and magnetite will affect um, these magnets on all sides of it. The transparent um, calcite, see the double refraction, you take that calcite mineral and put it over the, those words and you, you can see two images. And here's an example from the, um, this is actually a piece of limestone, 
but it's made of mineral calcite. You put hydrochloric acid on it and it will fizz. So when you take a little hydrochloric acid out of the field with you, and so when you're looking at a road cut, you can tell what's limestone and what's not. Okay, another kind of summary here, atoms to rocks, how they fit together. Again, a rock is an aggregate of minerals. A mineral is made up of multiple elements. Um, most of those elements in rocks are silicon and oxygen. When they combine, we call them silica. And silica combines in little tetrahedron, and depending on the shape of those tetrahedron will depend on what type of um, uh, mineral group or what type of rocks we'll see. Um, and also what type of cleavage planes we get in those type of minerals in those rocks. So here's a concept map, and I've gone ahead and filled in the answers. So minerals are naturally occurring inorganic solids composed of one or more elements that have a distinct chemical composition and have a uniform atomic, stru atomic structure, and they can be identified by the whole list of things we just went over, but four examples are crystal form, color, hardness, and cleavage.